Hello and welcome to today's ACM SIGSOFT webinar. This webcast is part of ACM SIGSOFT commitment to provide value to its current and future members. The ACM SIGSOFT webinar series features speakers from the Future of Software Engineering track at the International Conference of Software Engineering, as well as selected keynote speakers and distinguished paper authors. I'm Federica Sarro, Associate Professor at University College London in the United Kingdom, and it's my pleasure to welcome you today. Before we get started, I'd like to quickly mention a few housekeeping items shown on the slide in front of you. First, the slides will advance automatically throughout the event. On the bottom panel, you'll find a number of additional widgets and resources. If you're experiencing problems with the slides or audio, press the F5 key in Windows, Command plus R on a Mac, or refresh your browser on mobile devices. Or you can al also close and relaunch the presentation. To control volume, adjust the master volume on your computer. If you have questions during this webinar, please type them into the Q&A box at any time during the webinar and click the Submit button. At the end of the presentation, we will have time to respond to questions. This session is being recorded and will be archived. You will receive an automatic email notification when it becomes available. Today's presentation is The Joy and Frustration of Software Engineering by Mark Arman. Mark Arman works full-time at Facebook London and also holds a part-time professorship at University College London. At Facebook, he managed the team that deployed Sapiens to test mobile apps, leading to thousands of bugs being automatically found in multi-million line communication and social media apps, which are, in daily, which are daily used by over 1.4 billion people worldwide. Marco founded the field of search-based software engineering, a research area with authors spread over more than 40 countries, and is also known for work on source code analysis, software testing, app store analysis, and empirical software engineering. Mark received the Tripoli Harlan Mills Award and the ACM Outstanding Research Award in 2009 for this work. In addition to Facebook itself, Mark's scientific work is supported by the European Research Council with an, an advanced fellowship grant and has also been supported by the UK Engineering and Physical Science Research Council, for example, with platform and program grants. I have had the pleasure to closely work with Mark for over seven years now, and I can tell that he's not only an outstanding researcher, but also an exceptional leader, mentor, and colleague. Mark, without further, further ado, take it away. Thank you very much, Federico. Generous, Generous introduction. introduction. So, so, I hope my I hope slides my... are now visible um, to everyone and full screen mode. And um, I'm going to be talking today about the joys and frustrations of software engineering. It's particularly important, I think, to focus on both because I think that as a scientist and also as an engineer, we do get many, many frustrations. And I think that some of the future joys that we get from our work actually have their root cause in the earlier frustrations and wrestling with those. And I'm going to talk in today's talk about uh, some of the things that have frustrated me about software engineering, both research and practice, and then the, the way I've gotten joy from tackling these problems in particular with many of the excellent colleagues it's been my privilege to work with throughout my career. So I first encountered software when I was a, a teenager at school, and, and those days back in the 1980s, um, there were home computers that used um, cassette tapes in order to store and retrieve programs. Uh, and I had the good fortune to work with uh, some, some friends of mine, notably Peter Akid, uh, and we developed some games for the Sinclair Spectrum home computer. And this is the game I developed, um, which was called Sword Fight at Midnight. It's actually still available on emulators and you can still play it and see the clunky, flaky graphics, which I'll give you a demonstration of in a minute. Um, in fact, here we are. So in those days, when you play a, a game, you plug it into your television set. And this is pretty much what a television set looked like in, in 1983. And this was a sword fighting game uh, actually now being played on an emulator. And uh, it, the emulator is so faithful, you can even see the flickering of the, the graphics uh, as they were on the original game. 
Um, as you can see, it's not a tremendously wonderful game, uh, and obviously my future wasn't in graphic design. But one of the things I encountered was my programming in those days was self-taught, so I didn't really understand any of the principles of software engineering, and I wrote my code as hexadecimal code. So I'd look up the code, the opcodes for the Z80 assembler and, and poke those codes into the memory of the computer and then run them. Anyone who's ever done anything like this can imagine just how frustrating that might be. Um, for example, if we need to insert a new instruction in the middle of the code, all of the uh, absolute addresses change in the remaining code and have to be rewritten. Um, so it's really a very painful way of developing software. I think quite possibly apart from switching control switches, uh, which Seymour Cray is famed to have been able to do from memory, it's probably the most frustrating way to write software that's ever been invented. So it was a real amazing joy to me when I first discovered Assembler. I know that there's been lots of development since in high level languages, uh, and there were indeed at the time, but for me, the biggest leap in my programming productivity uh, came from when I switched from Hex to Assembler. Uh, and it, it was purely by chance our company was acquired and the uh, acquirer asked me to do a whole load of changes. And I said, well, this will take me months. And they said, months? You know, this is insane. It's only a few small changes. Um, should should be just, you know, a few weeks work. Uh, and we need to release it this summer to catch, you know, the, the, the summer market. So. When they discovered how I was writing the code, they said, well, here, just use an assembler. And they gave me, and then suddenly the, the scales fell from my eyes. In fact, this is the assembler that corresponds to that hex code. It comes from the program. It's probably still a little bit harder than reading the hex to understand, sorry, it's a little bit harder reading the hex to understand what's going on, and maybe not that much easier to understand the assembler. But if you happen to know that uh, the code 121 represents the key Y and the code 110 represents N. Sinclair didn't use standard ASCII uh, code. Then it's not so hard to guess what's going on here. In fact, we can see that we're loading a register, comparing with the Y character, jumping to somewhere if it's a Y and somewhere else if it's an N. Um, and this is happening repeatedly. So what's happening here is we're polling the keyboard and checking for a yes or no response. Uh, and if I needed to, uh, insert some extra code there, for example, to check for the precise key presses YES, it would have been really easy to insert that code in the assembler, but it would have taken me possibly uh, several hours in the hex. So from the frustration of trying to write code completely the wrong way, I feel that I really got the joy and the understanding of what comes from a from a high level language. And it was my first taste of the the power and importance of abstraction in software. So some time later, uh, I found myself as a, a fledgling researcher undertaking a PhD. I, I got my PhD in 1992, about 10 years after I ha had the initial coding experience. The PhD was functional models of procedural programs. Uh, I wouldn't encourage you to go and read it. It's not a tremendously good thesis. Um, and afterwards, of course, what every PhD student wants to do is publish their work. So I submitted my paper based on my thesis work to the computer journal, waited eagerly for the response, and it was rejected. But never mind, this is what happens when people first try and publish their work. So I realized that actually um, I, what I should do is I should submit to a conference and then go and present the work and get some feedback on it. So I submitted it to a conference called PEPM, and it was rejected. But never mind, because this particular conference had a little workshop associated with it. So of course, a workshop, very easy to get your work published in a workshop. It's really quite a low bar for entry. And this workshop was on exactly the topic, state in programming languages, which I thought I was attacking in my thesis. So I submitted to the workshop, and my paper was rejected. So I thought, well, maybe the problem here is that I'm not really a programming languages researcher. I'm a software engineer, and I discovered that there was a conference on software maintenance. And I thought, well, the application of what I was doing in modeling functional programs, it actually looked a little bit like program slicing. And maybe I should submit it to a software maintenance conference where that sort of topic was interesting. So I submitted to ICSM, and the paper was rejected. But I did get very helpful referees' comments, for which I'm eternally grateful. And I improved the paper, and I submitted again the following year and it was rejected. 
But ICSM had a little workshop spun off the International Workshop on Program Comprehension. And this workshop I submitted to, and the paper was accepted. And this was a process of learning. And I think that we underestimate the importance of referees of rejections and as authors too, because through that process, I, I learned a little bit better how to write a paper and how to communicate my ideas. And as you can see, it took quite a long time. So if there are any PhD students out there listening to this talk, I want to say to you, do not give up. Um, your, your work, if you believe in it, then the only way your work will be rejected is if you choose not to submit it again yourself. Uh, in fact, the greatest thing, I think, perhaps, about scientific work is the way in which it's monotonic. In almost any other field of, of, of human endeavour, you can go backwards as well as forwards. But in scientific work, once you've published your work, unless you're very unlucky, it stays published and the citations accrue and the interest can only go up. I mean, it may not go up, but it can't go down. And this monotonic property is, is very reassuring, um, particularly as you get into more advanced years. So I say to my students these days, that actually there's no such thing as a rejected paper. There is only not yet accepted papers. Uh, and I think that this is an important way. It's not just a word trick. It's, it's an important way to think of our work. The only way it really gets rejected is if we decide that based on the feedback we've got, it's not really worth carrying on. And that's a, a decision we sometimes should make. But if we don't make that decision, then the work's not yet rejected. And in fact, from that whole frustrating process of trying to publish my work and get better at explaining what I was doing, I got the first, possibly the greatest joy I've ever had from my scientific and uh, intellectual work. And that's, that's the joy of collaboration. One of the most exciting and, and rewarding aspects of scientific work is the way you can you can communicate with so many people, who you, some, some of whom you may never meet in person, many of whom you may get to meet and, and, and become great friends with. Um, so that's exactly what happened as a result of that publication. I was sitting at my desk one day and I received this email. Uh, they, they arrive about that fast in 1997. So someone I'd never met before and, and I'd only vaguely heard of at that point sent me an email to say, oh, I've read your paper and I've implemented it. I was completely flabbergasted. You know, the, the, the idea that someone had taken this work and actually done something with it like this. And I still work with Dave Binkley, uh, who, who did that now, uh, some 25 years later. And our latest paper uh, we've just submitted and uh, got referees' comments. It hasn't been rejected, but we have got quite a lot to think about. So thanks very much to those referees. And the idea in that paper is languages are generally Turing complete, and therefore most of the questions we would ask about most of the programs written in those languages are undecidable, at least many of the interesting ones, like does it terminate and is this piece equivalent to that piece? Although that's the case, there may exist, in fact they do exist, islands of code within those programs which are sub-Turing. And it may be useful to at first try and understand, well, how much of the code is sub-Turing and where it is sub-Turing, what could we do with that? Imagine, imagine if you could have a, a tool which automatically highlighted the code which was uh, written essentially in a language where you know termination can be decided. There's a lot you could do, particularly in static analysis, I think, with, with such information. And we might imagine a world in which we can perhaps grow and shrink the size of these islands by playing with the input parameters, perhaps a little bit like the way partial evaluation imagines. So you could try and find the maximally large islands uh, that are sub-Turing with the minimal amount of fixing of input parameters, for example. So I think this is a really interesting direction. And I've, I've um, really been able to do this work because I've been able to collaborate with such wonderful people. So in this particular paper, it's not just Dave Binkley, but also my colleague and friend Earl Barr from University College London and uh, fantastic postdoctoral researcher Nazim Segir, who worked on all the heavy lifting on this paper. So the idea for sub-Turing language analysis, I, when I first proposed this, was actually at a workshop called Source Code Analysis and Manipulation, or SCAM to its friends. And that was some 13 years before we wrote this paper. So the other interesting thing I think about research is often ideas take a long time to gestate. And uh, this is the 
slide that I put up at the um, the scam workshop in 2006, I think it was. Uh, and as you can see, we're still in the process of uh, responding to reviewers' comments on the paper that implements and uh, works on that uh, sometime later. So another message I'd love to give to researchers out there is, if you're excited by an idea, then the good news is, as long as there's breath remaining in your body and people you can collaborate with, that, that idea still has time to, to, to evolve and to, to come out. Although this particular one hasn't come out yet. So another aspect of collaboration is the wonderful workshops we have in the software engineering and computer science community. Uh, many people who've um, been to workshops at Dagstuhl in Germany will be familiar with this picture. It's the picture that everybody uh, who attends such a workshop always makes at the uh, end, towards the end of the workshop. They, they stand and have a group photo taken. And for those who don't know, Dagstuhl is a castle in Germany, which by um, the kindness of several universities, local governments and national government has been made available for the use of computer scientists with a different topic every week. And there's a by invitation workshop which brings in specialists in the area to work together in a really lovely setting without any distractions and with fantastic technical support to work on those topics. And the first DAG stool I attended was in uh, 1998 and it was on program slicing. And this is the group photo from that workshop. Um, I'm right at the back there. And inspired by the, the Dagstuhl experience, my colleagues and I founded a series of workshops that we ran at the university that we were at, uh, University College London, in the Crest Centre, the Centre for Evolution on Software Testing, Evolution Search and Testing. And it's extraordinary how one can have a workshop and then people will, will attend from all over the world. I, I just think it's such a an enriching thing as a for our species really that science can bring people together across all of these different national and cultural uh, divides that might otherwise separate us so this this map shows all the the countries from which people have attended crest open workshops over the years in fact over 2000 uh, people have registered for two, two, there have been over 2000 registrations from some 850 odd uh, attendees over um uh, 296 different institutions around the world from 44 different countries uh, and there have been over 500 talks given in this workshop. So I think we're up to workshop number 61 now and, and the, the last one in the series just completed um, yesterday, in fact. So this is called the Crest Open Workshop. I'd strongly recommend anyone who hasn't attended one to consider. It's completely uh, free. It's supported by various um, sources, in, including um, more recently Facebook, my current employer, for which many thanks, um, but also the Engineering and Physical Sciences Research Council, the uh, European Union and, and many other funding sources. Uh, and with that funding, the organisers run open workshops that anyone can attend on particular topics. They're usually two days and they're recorded and archived. So the people who attended the uh, Dagstuhl that I found so inspiring, many of them have gone on to be uh, leaders in their own right. And there's, there's me at the back, but the three people I want to draw attention to right now is Tom Rep, Susan Horwitz and Tim Teitelbaum, all of whom I met for the first time at the workshop and who gave me some fantastic ideas. In particular, they told me that the problem I was looking at in slicing was related to program schematology. I think I would never have occurred to me to look at that literature had I not attended the workshop. And as a result, my colleagues and I uh, made several contributions in the area of schematology. Funnily enough, we never actually answered the original question of schematology. In fact, collaboration has been a theme throughout my career, and, and I'm very lucky to have won these um, awards, like the Harlem Mills Award. But really, the, the awards belong equally to all of these people with whom I've had the pleasure to work over the years. I think there's over 300 people that I've uh, been privileged to uh, co-author papers with. Um, and another way, of course, in which you collaborate is through your PhD family tree. And I'd just like to say a little bit about mine. Um, I have several PhD students who are working as colleagues now at Facebook. Um, uh, here, here are four of them, in fact, who are all in the Sapiens team, which I'll be saying more about in a minute. But one thing I'd like to also mention, just as a curious addition, is that Sebastian Danicic, who was my own supervisor, didn't have a PhD when he supervised me. So that was interesting. So we both bit, being a bit mischievous, um, thought, well, wouldn't it be fun if I then supervised his PhD? 
So I believe I may be the only person uh, who is their own ancestor in the PhD family tree. And actually, it's not a tree as a result of that. It's uh, it's a graph. Uh, as my colleagues at Facebook will, I'm sure, tell you, I, I can take even the simplest data structure and screw it up. So if you look at the notes from the Dagstuhl, you'll see that at the time I was slight, I was getting interested in uh, heuristic algorithms, and this became a big theme for my career uh, from 2000 onwards, really, from the late 90s, in fact. Um, my frustration here, from which I derived a, a great deal of subsequent joy, I must say, was that the only engineering discipline that seemed not to be using computational search was software engineering. And that seemed bizarre because computational search was a, was implemented in software and it not used in software engineering, not much anyway, was used some. So this led me and, and many other colleagues, I must say, um, I, I, I can best say I'm a co-founder of this field. I'm not the only founder by any means. And there was lots of work using optimization in software engineering before I did. But for me, the, the frustration led me to, to want to work hard to champion this area of search-based software engineering, the, essentially the intersection of search-based optimization and software engineering. Um, I said that many people worked on this before me, and I did some archaeology to try and trace back the scientific and intellectual roots. And I found this quote. Uh, you might wonder where this comes from and, and how long ago it might be before my 2001 paper. Um, actually, it's definitely not in this paper, which is uh, very generously by many people regarded as the a founding paper in search-based software engineering. But it actually belongs to uh, an author from 1842, uh, and that is, of course, none other than Ada Lovelace, who uh, was the first, I think, to mention software optimization. Many people cite Ada for her, her um, poetic evocation of the way the analytical engine uh, did its computation in a very similar way to a Jacquard loom weaving um, weaving the algebraic equations in the same way the, the loom might weave patterns. But I think perhaps the most important scientific contribution is, is much better captured by this extraordinary insight that she had. So imagine this is before, uh, before Edison was born. So there was no electric light. This was written by candlelight. Steam was the power for, for the computation envisaged in those days. And yet Ada could already see that if one was to have computers, one would have software. And if one was to have software, one would have to optimize the order in which the software was executed. Extraordinarily prescient work. Many, many people have, have made fantastic contributions since then in, in computer science. A uh, hundred years later, Turing was writing about, um, about uh, assertions in code. This is actually possibly where we see the origins of both uh, testing and verification. Uh, it was a short paper, incidentally, uh, only four pages. Um, then in 1962, we see the first occurrence of the idea of test data generation being automated. It was purely random at that time. And then winding forwards, we see the first idea of using um, some kind of optimization, in this case, linear programming in testing and verification. And in the mid 70s, we see two papers which use what we call meta heuristic search. So a search where the where the, the the outcome may change each time, but at least we can use that to guide a search for test data. Around the 1990s, Bogdan Carell was doing work on, on an approach that became known as the automating alternating variable method. And this is still used in many practical program um, testing technologies these uh, currently, so that's to the test of time. And it wasn't until 1992 that we see the first use of genetic algorithms in any software engineering problem, to, to the best of my knowledge. Uh, all of these published a long time before I came along and published my 2001 paper with Brian Jones, which um, coined the phrase search-based software engineering. And I think that if there is a contribution to that work, it's really to just say that this is something that we can apply across the whole of software engineering, not just in particular isolated points. So another frustration I had was that as my research career developed, I was being successful at publishing after many initial hiccups, and that was, was nice. And I was getting funding, which was very rewarding. But increasingly, I was getting frustrated that 
I felt almost guilty that I was getting the funding and, 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 and building a team, but our work wasn't really being used in practice. And I was asked to do the research excellence framework process for my university. This is something which is a particular uh, exercise done in the UK. And the goal here is to evaluate the research. The, the government wants to know how good is the research in each department. It's um, a very labor intensive process, but part of the process in 2014 involved assessing impact. And so I was tasked with understanding the impact of the research in our department and advocating for it. And I realized that much of the impact came not from uh, placing PhD students or doing consultancy, although that was their very good routes to impact, but by academics starting up companies. And in particular, I was inspired by the Monoidics Company, which was founded by several researchers at uh, Queen Mary, Imperial College and University College London. Um, and they formed this company, Monoidics, which they worked on for, for several years, developing uh, applications of separation logic to program uh, verification with, with notable success. And in 2013, they were acquired by Facebook. This is the, uh, the acquisition uh, post. There's B. Lavender, who is the CEO, Peter Ahern, Dino Di Stefano, and uh, Cristiano Calcagno, who actually, the, the, the three of those, those last three moved to Facebook and founded the team which went on to develop the technology now known as Infer. And more importantly, perhaps still, that technology was made open source. So it didn't just benefit Facebook, where it found tens of thousands of bugs which got fixed. It also was released back to the scientific community and to other companies to, to use. So there was a very virtuous circle. I was very, very impressed by this and influenced by it. And I was also slightly ashamed and frustrated that uh, here I was, a professor of software engineering, yet these, these programming language researchers knew much more about software engineering than I, I did and were actually putting their work into practice. So to cut a long story short, um, Two colleagues, uh, UHR and Kermal, pictured here on the, uh, the right-hand side of this picture, myself formed a, a company called Magica, and we were fortunate enough to be acquired by Facebook, who's subsequently invested very uh, admirably in the team that is now known as Sapiens. Uh, here's a picture of the team from about this time last year um, at uh, Facebook. Fe Federica work, is working as a contractor on the team. Everybody else you see in the picture is now a full-time employee at Facebook. Uh, and at that time was working on the Sapiens team. And the idea of the Sapiens work was to bring to Facebook this idea of automated design of test cases. So the current state in industry is that machines execute tests, but engineers still have to do the work of designing them. So we wanted to try and use this idea that tests live in a, an enormous search space, far too big to enumerate, to allow machines to design test cases by searching that space preferably intelligently, but even if it has to be at random, then it's still a way to search the space. Uh, as you remember from my little history lesson earlier on, it was back in 1962 that we saw the first automated test technology, actually in COBOL it was for those days, which was a random search. And the big challenge, of course, in deploying this at Facebook was scalability. The scale is quite astounding. So this is a picture of the social graph, to put it into numbers. Uh, at the time I gave this talk at ICSI, 1.52 billion people were using uh, Facebook every single day. That's about 2.7 billion using the whole family of apps uh, monthly. And uh, in Canada, where I was giving the talk, that was about two thirds of the, uh, the population of the country, I believe, 24 million, if I remember correctly. And as a software engineer, what this means is that we, we get over 100,000 commits to the repository every week. A lot of software changes to test. So you'd think the scalability challenge would make it very hard to scale up a, a testing tech. But the interesting thing is that although the diffs are coming in very fast, as I say, there are approximately, there are over 100,000 uh, per week. The elastic infrastructure we have at Facebook allows us to scale up the response. So we have this one world infrastructure on which the company is blogged, which allows us to deploy our search on multiple mobile phones. So at any given time, hundreds of mobile phone emulators are being used to test the, the diffs that are coming in and we can scale up. It looks a little bit like this. Here's a, here's a, a small section of emulators running 
the sapiens technology which essentially is searching in much the same way as the the search space here is the is the input to the uh, to the program under test so it's a sequence of events that that happen at the interface that the the human would use so it's a, it's a very much a system level testing technology and these are what you're seeing on the screen there is multiple apps being tested on multiple emulators using the the sapiens technology if you're interested in reading more about how we deployed Sapiens at Facebook, there is a, a keynote paper from SSBSE deploying search-based software engineering with Sapiens at Facebook. And it also goes into some of the DevOps uh, experiences that we had in that deployment. So uh, one, one of the interesting things for me as a researcher, I have read about DevOps but never experienced it, was to make this transition and to um, be in a position to see how 24 7 deployment brings with it devops commitments and in fact i'm actually uh having been the manager of the sapiens team uh i've, I've now transitioned to being a research scientist in a, a new team that we started up a few months ago in london whose goal it is is to take big bets on exciting research projects and bring them to facebook and i'm currently on call uh for that team so if my phone rings and i suddenly had to switch off this uh this uh, webcast then you'll know what's happened so what kind of faults does Sapiens find? It's a testing technology that uses search to try and search the space of test case of possible event sequences to find a test case. Uh, and the goal is, the, the oracle here, the, the goal of the testing is to, is to find bad behavior like crashes and uh, app not responding out of memory errors, that kind of thing. So here's uh, a distribution of the bugs found that cause apps to crash. Uh, these, of course, then get reported to developers and they fix them long before they get into production. But these are the, this is distribution of the bugs found by Sapiens. As you can see, uh, there's one that dominates. Uh, and it's actually quite similar if we use the same technology on the top 1,000 apps in the, uh, the top 1,000 Android apps uh, by, by popularity in terms of downloads. So the kinds of bugs that Sapiens is finding for Facebook engineers are similar to the kinds of bugs that Sapiens can find for other Android apps. And therefore, when Sapiens becomes made open source, as, as we intend to, uh, to make it open source, then it will be, I hope and believe, useful to other engineers working on Android apps. So at the time I gave the talk, uh, these, these figures were up to date, and the fix rate for the bugs reported by Sapiens was about 75%, which I think is a very strong sign that the technology is able to give strong positive signal, very few false positives. Um, in the paper, we discussed this issue of pseudo false positives, which is an interesting one, but not one I have time to go in now. And we also discussed the issue of actually being able to detect fixes, which is an interesting research problem, I think, for the for the research community, but not one I have time to go into now, but it, the details are in the paper I cited earlier. So when I gave the, the talk to, in receipt of the Harlem Mills Award, I was preceded by the most influential paper award. Uh, and this was uh, received by um, Wes Weimer, Claire Leguess, uh, Than Nguyen, and Stephanie Forrest for their really, truly groundbreaking work on, on program repair. And one nice, pleasant symmetry to that was that Wes and Claire had actually presented at the very first of those Crest Open workshops that I mentioned earlier. If you remember, we're up to now 61st Crest Open workshop, but the first one was in November 2009. You can still go and look at a video of the talk where Wes introduced uh, repair in 2009, soon after the ICSI paper, which won the most influential paper award 10 years later. So it was a great pleasure to follow them in, in the talk I gave. And in particular, because one of the people I mentioned in the Sapiens team here, Alexandru Marginian, as well as being a fantastic PhD student at UCL, also did an internship at Facebook where he deployed a technique we, we called SAPFIX, which was the combination of program repair and automated search. The search using Sapiens, hence SAP, and the fix being mutation-based repair, combined with a wonderful technology called Getafix, which the company has since published on and which was being developed by our colleagues in the probability team in Menlo Park. So the lovely thing about doing an internship at Facebook is the potential for impact. 
Alexandru has subsequently joined the team full time uh, and is about to submit his PhD. If you're watching, aren't you, Alex? It's due any moment now. But as well as being an excellent PhD student and a fantastic intern and then a hire, he had the chance to see his PhD work deployed at scale at Facebook. And at this point, if I was giving the talk in public, I'd ask people to put their hands up if they uh, have an Android phone with any of these apps, Messenger, Facebook, or Instagram installed on the phone. Uh, usually about between a third and a half of the audience put their hands up. And perhaps if you've got such a phone now, I'd like you to just quickly have a look at it if you're running any of those three apps. Because if you're running those three apps on your Android phone, then you are running software that has been automatically repaired. And it's been automatically repaired to fix bugs that were automatically detected by the Sapiens technology, which automatically designed the test cases that found the bugs. So you're running what we would call in the scientific community genetically improved code. And the reason you're running it is because of a PhD intern's work at Facebook. So Alex was able to deploy his work and see it having impact on potentially over a billion people worldwide, uh, certainly hundreds of millions on, uh, for each app. And I think this is really very, very inspiring as a, as a, as a PhD student and as a supervisor and as a researcher, that the fact that you can get on public transport, see people using a product and know that that product has actually been automatically tested and improved by technologies you've developed there really can be no, no better feeling than, than, than for, for a scientist than to, to, to feel that impact. And it's a testimony, not just to, to Alexandru, but to the, the way in which uh, tech companies develop software and deploy it and, and can get immediate feedback and improvement that, that this is now possible. If there are any PhD students watching, I would strongly encourage you to consider doing an internship. There are many companies at which you can do an internship. And if you're interested in doing one at Facebook, then by all means, get in touch with me and I'll put you in touch with the relevant people. So in conclusion, I just want to come back to uh, how I mentioned the frustration that the Infer team had actually got better at doing software engineering in one year than I'd managed in 25 years of being a professor of software engineering. To say that when we came to Facebook and deployed Sapiens, we also had this tremendous joy that we were able to work with the Infer team to combine Sapiens and Infer. Essentially, Infer is a technology that uses static analysis to find likely program faults, whereas Sapiens is a technology that uses dynamic analysis to find likely program failures. So you can imagine where the two agree. So Infer says this line of code may be, for example, a null pointer exception, and Sapiens says this this line of code seems to cause a crash, null pointer exception, here's the evidence, then that's now a very strong signal to our engineers that there definitely is a problem. And I think last time I checked, over 90% of these uh, got fixed when the tools essentially gang up and report together. But the other way in which they can combine was in the repair work. So Sapiens might find a, a null pointer crash for Sapfix to repair. It, it, only, it only attempts to repair null pointers at the moment but it may not know exactly where it should be trying to repair, whereas infer may have actually given exactly that signal. So we use infer to be more precise in the localization that then allows um, the faults, the failures identified by Sapiens to be fixed by Sapfix. So what's lovely is the way these things can all combine. So before I go to questions, I'd just like to suggest some of the open problems that we have. These are covered in the deployment paper I mentioned. Um, so these are, some of the problems that we've encountered along the way as we deployed Sapiens uh, in the Sapiens team. It was my great pleasure to manage the team uh, for two and a half years, but as I say, I've now transitioned from being a manager on that team to being a research scientist on a different team, but I'm still very happy in talking to people in the scientific community or otherwise about these problems. And um, I can also uh, make introductions to the relevant people at Facebook if, if you're interested in that. So many people in industry have talked about this problem of flaky tests. Um, I'm, I'm sure I don't need to go into too much detail on this one, but uh, the, the problem is essentially that a test may fail, but then pass and then fail 
and the passing and failing might not be to do with any change. So it could be that nothing changes and yet that you run the test in exactly apparently the same conditions and it fails one minute and it passes the next. So we say that we say the test is flaky. That's a bit unfair on the test. It's not really the test. It's the, the code that we're executing is non-deterministic. And increasingly code is non-deterministic. And this is, is quite a challenge. I think it's one that um, deserves more attention and I'm very grateful and pleased that Facebook was able to fund a call for funding proposals uh, on this and other problems recently and we were very impressed by the by the proposals we received to tackle that. As I mentioned also fixed detection is a problem actually knowing whether something has been fixed or not in production is is actually a non-trivial problem and any kind of automated testing technology relies on automation of the oracle and this is a remaining open problem, which I'd love to see more work on. We also need to widen our concept of what a search space is to include, for example, the state in which the user is, the state of their phone, the, the um, in our case, say, for example, with uh, social media apps, the state of their friends network and so on. This, this all is part of the wider search space that we need to search for test cases. And we need smarter ways to measure unobtrusively the white box coverage achieved by technology. You may think coverage is a solved problem, but uh, I'm, I'm here to tell you that it's not. Um, it would be really great to see ways of combining static and dynamic analysis. I hinted at a few where we've combined infer and sapiens, but there's much more that can be done there. Another very exciting problem is, is known as carving, which is where you essentially carve out a unit test from a system test. Uh, and there's been some very exciting work on that uh, uh, over the years in the scientific community, and I'd love to see more work in that area and to, to see that deployed in industry where I think it can have a lot of impact. I think that we actually have three sources of signal for, for testing. We have automated test design, but we also have um, our developers. I think they can help with your automated Oracle problem by, by giving that, that domain knowledge and inserting Oracle information, perhaps in the form of assertions. But we also have a further source of automated oracle from, from users. So crowdsourcing of um, what it is that customers like about products, I think is another potentially interesting source of information. So I'd love to see research on hybrids that combine machine intelligence to do automated search with better coverage, perhaps guided by smarter white box coverage, augmented by um, just the right amount, preferably the minimal necessary amount of, of human effort from the developers to give the Oracle and the minimum amount of unobtrusive human uh, insight from, from users in the form of crowdsourcing of the, the Oracle in terms of uh, essentially acceptance testing, if you will. There's huge amounts of work to be done on automated fixing, and I think there's very, very exciting research taking place in this area. I'd love to see it branch out from just fixing bugs to fixing all sorts of other issues and improving software in general, improving its various performance characteristics. Uh, this is an area that's become known as genetic improvement, and I'm very excited about developments in this field. So there's some possible things uh, that we could talk about in the question and answer session, but I'm sure you've got many other questions for me, and so I'll shut up now and, and wait for some questions. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank Over you, to you Mark. Federica. Over to you, Federica. Thank you, Mark. Um, our first question um, is, um, do you have uh, an impression of whether engineers uh, prefer act um, upon feedback from sapiens or uh, infer? So, so if I understand it, the question is, do engineers prefer to act on the signal they're getting from infer or from sapiens? That's a very interesting question. So infer is a static technology, so it can give the signal earlier than sapiens can because at the at the time they 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 write the code, they can get signal uh, just as you would with another static analysis technology. So I think I think developers definitely like that. But then on the other hand, sapiens is finding likely failures, so it will say I actually can show you a crash, and here's a video that shows you the app crashing. So developers like that. They like the fact that they know this this is very likely a failure and it isn't necess it isn't maybe a bug that could never happen in practice so actually i think they're kind of orthogonal there are different reasons why developers like either technology they're not um, in any way 
um, substitutes for one another. In fact, as I as I, I hope I convince people in the talk, they are complementary. Thanks. So um, the second question. Um, are you interested in learning about the faster, less expensive way to softer quality overall? I think I'd need to know what it was far more than the far. Then what, what, what you are having at the moment, I think. Can we do even better than what your, your uh, uh, team has already greatly achieved? I'm absolutely convinced we can do that. I'd be very excited, very excited to see any possibilities to do that. Thank you. 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 Thank is this uh, uh, can this technology be applied to testing for user interface accessibility? Thank you for that question. That's a very interesting question. There is a lot of exciting and interesting research being done on the usability and accessibility testing. And uh, I do believe that Sapiens can be used for that because essentially we try and cover the app. So, so long as we have an Oracle uh, and that's a that's a key a piece of the puzzle, then really Sapiens can be used to test anything that you have an oracle that can measure. So if you can if you can capture lack of accessibility with a, an oracle that you can automate, then Sapiens can test that just as it can test other problems. But I wouldn't like to say that Sapiens is the only technology. There are both static and dynamic analysis being developed in the research community and I, I watch that space with great interest. I think it's a very important uh, problem. And uh, I know many people in the research community are tackling it. Uh, thanks. Uh, we have another interesting question about uh, um, if code will ever be written mainly by pseudocode expressing the, the requirements. Would you Do you envisage that in the future? Actually, I do. Actually, yes. I do. Yes. Can, can you mute, Federico? Can Thanks. you mute, Federico? Thanks. So, it's a very interesting question, and it, it, it's one that I've spent a lot of time thinking about. Essentially, the idea of genetic improvement is that we take existing code and we try to improve it some. So, in a way, that would lead to a hybrid world in which maybe some initial systems written by humans get improved gradually by, by machine. Uh, people will often say, ah, oh, but maybe the improvements will be kind of like hard to maintain because they're written by machine. But actually, there's been research uh, by Wes Weimer and others that, that shows that you can actually just give that as an extra constraint to the machine. In fact, it could possibly do a better job than humans in documenting the changes it's made because it can be completely uh, consistent and uh, reliable in that documentation. So imagine a world in which you started with human written code and gradually it's being improved by genetic improvement. There comes a time when more of the code is written by the machine than by the human. And if you can improve pieces of code, then if we can find the right way to decompose, and if we can then gradually automate that, then there's no reason why we couldn't have machines writing more of the code. But then would we really say that machines had written the code, or would it be more like actually we'd moved up to a higher level of abstraction? And the thing that we currently think of as source code, Java, C, uh, ML, whatever, prolog, if you're really perverse. Uh, I didn't say that, but then we currently think of that as source code, but if that's starting to be generated by machine in response to some higher level requirement specification or pseudo, then this, this, that higher level specification becomes what we probably think of now as the programming language, and, and, and what the machine is generating becomes more like the object code. So in a way, you could say machines are already writing our programs because a compiler produces the thing that gets executed on the machine anyway. And I, I started my talk by thinking about hex as my language and then assembler and then so on. So I do think that we, we will, I hope in my lifetime, come to a place where machines aren't just uh, designing code, but they're allowing developers to search the, the what we might think of as a Pareto surface of, a Pareto response surface of, of possible programs that can all share the same functionality but have different non-functional properties. 
And uh, I talk about this in uh, in a paper in uh, ASE, Automated Software Engineering uh, 2012, uh, a keynote uh, paper that I was fortunate to present there. And I, I do think this is something that uh, will happen, and I hope it'll happen in my lifetime, but I think it is inevitable. But as I say, once it's happened, we, we won't say, wow, wasn't that amazing? We'll say, ah, we just got a new kind of high-level programming language. So uh, it won't seem so surprising by the time it's happened. Thanks, Mark. Following up on this question, um, we received uh, um, an inquiry about uh, uh, with all these tools that uh, uh, seems able to identify failure and fixes and applying them automatically, what are the implications for software developers uh, and how they work, especially in the future? That's a very good question. I'm glad uh, that it was asked because uh, so some programmers programs react in, in one of three ways to automated repair and genetic improvement and they, they, they seem to divide anecdotally i'd say that there's roughly a third in each box so about a third say actually this is really obvious and trivial and i already did it before and this isn't much exciting you know nothing much to see here uh, about a third say wow this is amazing it's exciting I'm, I'm really excited it's like stepping into the future in fact the first the reaction we got from the first developer, which we reported in the ICSI paper we wrote about Satfix, was, wow, this felt like living in the future, which is very encouraging if you're uh, doing research in the area. But about a third say, oh, this is scary. This could take my job. This, this feels like, you know, the bots are coming to get me. And I really want to address that, that third with, with, with the answer here, because I think it's really not the case. If you think about it, what we currently think of as the as the intellectually challenging task can recede once we realize how to automate it and then what happens is we find new more exciting intellectual tasks at higher levels of abstraction we've seen this throughout um, the development of our species not just in software so i really don't think most people get up in the morning and think you know i really 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 want to spend my day to day designing test cases you know even the most ardent advocate of software testing does not think it should be a human centered activity and most software testers would be glad if they could shed that and maybe move to instead trying to think about what oracles they should be defining that capture the properties that are important in the systems that they're they're testing such so an automated test can do the legwork of finding coverage and so on similarly i don't think anybody wakes up in the morning and says i can't wait to get to work to fix the bug i've been struggling with for the last two days if there was a technology that could automatically fix the bug, I'm sure most of us would be happy. And it wouldn't put us out of a job, but it would actually give us a more interesting and exciting job. So I think that as with many, many technologies we've uh, seen the development of, what happens through automation, and this is just more automation, is that the humans get to do the more interesting stuff and the automation takes away the legwork and the tedium. Thank you, Mark. Um, we have lots of questions. I mean, I'm finding it really hard to, to, to pick them because we, we're receiving so many questions. So next one is about um, Sapiens and Infer, the tools you, you, you're uh, developing at Facebook. Um, are these tools specific to Facebook and uh, are these language specific tools? Thanks, that's another very good question. So. Uh, Infer is actually, as I mentioned in the talk, is now open source. You can go and play with it and you can contribute to its development. And I think that's one of the wonderful things about the way Facebook does its its core infrastructural engineering. And that is that um, there is a, a, a tendency to want to make these things open source and to contribute back to the community. So there is also an, an aspiration to make Sapiens open source once we've got done with building out the, the essential tech. It's obviously the, a bit behind infer because it started development a few years later and then to come back to the question about well are they specifically for facebook so infer has actually been used by many other companies and developed so i, I think it's there's evidence to prove that it's not just facebook specific but each instance of infer is language specific because it's a static analysis so if you have some new domain specific language you would need to write some some um some 
uh, translation code so that it can work well. But it does work on an intermediate language. So really, it's not it's not like rebuilding building the whole thing from scratch. In the case of Sapiens, the evidence I gave in the talk shows that the kind of bugs we find at Facebook with Sapiens are very similar in their distribution to the kinds of bugs you find when you run Sapiens on on the top 1,000 apps in the App Store. So there's every reason to believe that Sapiens uh, would be just as applicable to other people's code as it is to at Facebook. And unlike Infer, being a, a, a testing technology that's essentially a black box, there is some white box for the uh, coverage, but notwithstanding that, um, it's not so tightly coupled to the programming language. It is much more coupled, of course, to the platform. So uh, Sapiens for iOS, is, is a different, uh, you know, it's a, it, you need some work to make it run for iOS and uh, then separately for Android, for example. But once we get done with making it open source, it'll provide a nice platform on which people can generate tests for, for both uh, and possibly other, other platforms too. And researchers can use that to build on the interesting problems rather than dealing with the, 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 the tedious details of running on those platforms. Thank you, Mark. Uh, very uh, last question. Um, is it possible to read about sub Turing Island uh, somewhere? I think you mentioned the river wasn't published, but there's been this question if if there's any pointer you, you can give at this stage. Thanks for the question. Yes, I'm very question. glad. Yes, I'm very glad. So the paper is uh, available on archive, you know, the uh, I don't know how to, how to uh, pronounce this correctly, but A-R-X-I-V, uh, the uh, open source platform for, not open source, what am I talking about? Sorry, it's been a long day. The, um, the uh, open access platform for making available uh, pre-peer review papers. So it is, I believe, available there where people can have a look at it. Uh, if, you, if you search on harm and subturing, something like that, I think it'll come up. Okay, uh, thank you, uh, Mark. Uh, I'm afraid uh, we have run out of uh, uh, time today. So I'd like to uh, thank uh, once again, Mark, for his uh, informative presentation and insightful uh, answers to the many questions. Uh, special thanks to each of you for taking the time to attend and participate in uh, today's uh, webinar. Uh, this webinar was recorded and will be available online in a few days at www.sigsoft.org uh, slash resources slash webinars.html. You can find announcement on upcoming SCM and Sigsoft webinars and other SCM activities uh, online at learning.scm.org and www.sigsoft.org. On behalf of Sigsoft, the speaker and myself, thanks again for joining us. We hope you will join us again in the future. This concludes today's webinar.